everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Bryn Fury, and I am a Clean Energy Associate with Environment America. Today, Environment America and US PERG are hosting a day of action called Clean Energy Homes Day to celebrate the benefits of home electrification. So I'd like to start by saying welcome and also happy Clean Energy Homes Day. Um, as part of our day of action, I will be moderating today's discussion about how to make um, your home into a clean energy home. And before we begin, we will have brief opening remarks from US Senator Martin Heinrich. Senator Heinrich is a clean energy homes champ who serves as co-chair of the Congressional Electrification Caucus. And he is also the sponsor sponsor of the Federal Zero Emission Homes Act, which will create rebates to reduce the overall cost of purchasing and installing clean electric appliances. Um, Senator Heinrich had another engagement to attend to at this time, but he has very kindly recorded comments, which we will share in just a moment. Um, and after we hear from the Senator, we are going to kick off a discussion with our five wonderful panelists to talk about um, how to go about the process of electrifying your home, what kinds of challenges can come up and how we can solve them. So joining us today for our panel, we have Johanna Newman, Senior Director of Environment America's Campaign for 100% Renewable Energy, Matt Cassell, Director of US PERG's Environment Campaigns, Joel Rosenberg, author of Rewiring America's Electrify Everything in Your Home Report, Christopher Matos Rogers, founder of sustainability-focused real estate team, the Matos Rogers Group, and finally, Julia Piper, Vice President and um, of Communications and Policy at Goodleap. So we are very excited to get into it with all of our great panelists. But first, let's hear from Senator Martin Heinrich about the benefits of home electrification, his own personal experience going electric, and the Zero Emission Homes Act. So I'm going and Aaron will share our video. Hi everyone. I'd like to thank Environment America for bringing us all together to bring attention to the critical importance of electrifying our homes. As a founder of the new Electrification Caucus, I am incredibly excited by the momentum that we're building to make the electrification of everything central to our climate fight. With all of the climate catastrophes occurring all around us, I found that it can become all too easy to feel powerless to make a difference. But the engineer in me learned a long time ago to break down even the most complex problems, like our carbon pollution problem, into manageable pieces. And any way you look at it, cleaning up our energy sector will play the largest role in our climate fight. Around 90% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from our use of fossil energy, from coal to fossil gas and oil. For years, so much of our climate policy framework has been focused on how we can attack the supply side of this fossil energy pollution problem. And it's obviously a critical mission to transition our electric power sector towards clean, pollution-free electricity. But we are never going to meet the full scale of this challenge until we also address the demand side of the equation. That means eliminating the approximately 40% of our energy-related carbon emissions that come from the things that we have in our homes, in our offices, in our driveways. It's not just our cars and trucks, though we certainly need to accelerate the transition towards electric vehicles, particularly here in the U.S. where we have fallen behind so many other countries in EV adoption. But we also need to confront the millions of fossil gas-fired water heaters, furnaces, stovetops, dryers, and ovens in our home, homes and offices. There are substantially better, safer, and cleaner electric alternatives for each of these fossil fuel burning machines in our homes. Each of these electric substitutes can help reduce our climate pollution, improve our health, and create significant savings on our energy bills. Now, I've seen this firsthand over the last year as I've been working to electrify my home in New Mexico. Earlier this year, I went to a hardware store to purchase and install our home's 
second air source heat pump water heater. And I knew that these appliances were, were good in theory, but now that I have them in my own home, I can honestly say that I've been amazed by how inexpensive, how efficient, quiet, and for that matter, just unpolluting heat pumps have become to operate. Now, instead of spending three or 400 bucks a year with the old inefficient gas water heater to heat up all those showers that my teenage kids take, as I did in the past, I'll be spending closer to $150 a year with a new heat pump hot water heater. That type of savings, compounded over multiple appliances, can make a major difference in reducing a family's energy burden. Because they're running off of electricity, my new heat pumps are never burning fossil gas in my home, creating unhealthy indoor air pollution from methane or benzene or other harmful compounds. By replacing appliances that rely on fossil fuels, we can also reduce our country's reliance on foreign oil and gas imports, something that has become all the more urgent as we confront Russia's oil and gas funded war in Ukraine. We can also insulate more families, pun intended, from the wild price spikes associated with fossil fuel based commodities like gas and home heating oil. Finally, and most importantly, when we choose to go electric, we can each do our part to reduce our carbon pollution and help pass on a more livable planet to our kids and future generations. For all of these reasons, I want every family to be able to see the benefits that come from installing clean and efficient electric appliances in their homes. The catch right now is that the costs for these clean electric appliances are sometimes more expensive for consumers on the front end, even though they provide enormous long-term savings. This will change as more of us choose electrification. As the market encourages American manufacturers to produce more and more of these appliances, that in turn will dramatically drive down costs for consumers. It's a pretty predictable cost versus adoption curve that we have seen play out time and again with consumer goods like cell phones. But right now, if we want more families to choose electrification, we need to levelize the upfront point of sale costs. That's especially true for low and middle income households who stand to benefit the most from savings on their energy bills. And that's what my bill, the Zero Emission Homes Act, would do by establishing a new point of sale rebate program for new electrified appliances. It's critical that we provide targeted economic incentives, incentives that will help low and middle income families realize the full benefits of electrifying their homes. Because a climate solution that leaves low income families behind is not really a climate solution at all. I worked hard to secure a version of the Zero Emissions Homes Act rebates alongside all of the other critical climate investments that were in the House passed version of the Build Back Better Act. We are obviously still fighting to find the right path forward to pass those climate investments out of the Senate. But I want to encourage all of you to keep calling on your senators and keep demanding that we find a way forward on climate action. This remains our best chance to enact major climate investments at the federal level. We can't afford to waste it. I'll keep doing everything I can to make sure that electrification rebates are part of the final equation. Thank you all. Great. Um, and we want to thank Senator Heinrich for all that he is doing to ensure that electrification rebates are available to Americans all across the country so that we can act now on climate change and move towards a future powered by 100% renewable energy. So now let's turn to our speakers for a conversation about exactly how we're going to build that future, starting right in our own homes. Um, we got a little bit of this from Senator Heinrich, but my first question for you is why do we need to electrify our homes? And Matt, let's start with you. Well, thanks, Bren. Um, thanks for having me and thanks everybody for joining. And of course, thanks to Senator Heinrich for his, his words and, and his hard work on this issue. Um, you know, there are a lot of reasons to electrify your own home. Um, protect your family's health, save on costs, et cetera. We'll talk about a lot of those uh, uh, during this panel, I'm sure. Um, 
But I, I'd say the, the top reason that we need to facilitate a, a massive switch to electrification on a broad scale um, away from the use of fossil fuels um, it was, was hammered home by the, the International Panel on Climate Change just a little over a week ago when they released a new report that detailed the impacts of climate change that we're already experiencing and, and the impacts that we will continue to see um, if we don't make progress on reducing emissions. Um, and the, the report warned, warned that any further delay in concerted anticipatory global action and adaptation and mitigation on climate change will miss a brief and rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all, which I think is a is there's no better warning bell or clarion call for for the need to take action on this and 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 our buildings, our homes and buildings, and the fossil fuels we use in them are are no uh, no exception. Yeah, absolutely, I couldn't agree more, um, Christopher. Yeah, no, and those are great comments. Uh, you know, again, thank you for Environment America having this today. Um, Matt, great, great points there. Um, the single biggest opportunity to impact emissions is in the built environment. Um, roughly 40% of our emissions come from the energy use in our homes and our buildings. And obviously, since COVID, um, we are spending more time indoors than we ever have before. And I don't know that that's going to change much uh, in, in the next coming years. But we have to electrify first so that we can clean up the energy, the electricity sources that we do have. Um, and we cannot reach that without electrifying our home. So it's a very important opportunity um, and, and being able to help people understand what burning combustion fuels in their house is actually doing uh, is key for us having better, better quality homes, maintaining home ownership, obviously with the rapidly increasing prices of homes, um, energy burden is huge. So there's just a lot to, to gain here. Yeah, the energy burden really is um, quite large and, and we do have a long way to go and I'm hoping we can get into it a little bit more today. Um, Joel, did you have something that you wanted to add on why we need to electrify our homes? Yeah, thanks for having us. Uh, and thanks to Senator Heinrich. He, he laid it out, um, but to, just to clarify what he said, why we need to electrify our homes. Uh, I heard from a California Energy Commissioner, uh, a distillation of a solution to climate change that has arisen. And it's essentially clean the grid and make it renewable, electrify our vehicles and uh, because they're the number one emitter and uh, get all the fossil fuels as much as we can out of our homes and buildings. And the first two are kind of happening, uh, but the third one has gotten a lot less attention. And uh, we need everybody to essentially commit to doing it in their own home in order to get to zero. So, uh, you know, all the points that people, you know, that, that were made previously are valid, but I want people to appreciate that there is a solution to climate change. We just need to implement it and everybody has to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and everybody here has had some experience starting to get those fossil fuel powered appliances out of our homes, um, which is why it's such a, a great panel that we have here. Um, so I have a few questions about what that process has been like. Um, and I wanna start with what exactly motivated you to start making the switch over to electric appliances? Um, and Joel, I'm just gonna turn it right back over to you. Uh, I'm a renter, and so I've made a couple of changes that I have within my capability, but I haven't done everything yet. But I did write this book for Rewiring America called Electrify Everything in Your Home, which is a free download available at rewiringamerica.org. And uh, I did that in part because Saul Griffith, uh, who I know from previous work, uh, is a co-founder of Rewiring America. He was working on his own book called Electrify, which came out in October. Uh, and it's sort of the why we need to electrify. But last year, early last year, he suggested that maybe I should write how to electrify. And so I did a bunch of research and tried to consolidate it down as succinctly and clearly as I can while still being thorough um, to try and get people working on the problem. And so um, that's what motivated me is learning, again, that there's a solution. We just need everybody to do it. And how do we get everyone doing it? And it's not, it's not as hard as people think. They just need to make a plan. 
Well, I'm hoping that everybody leaves this um, discussion today, knowing that it's not as hard as we think. Um, Matt, I would love to hear from you about um, what motivated you to start making the switch to electric appliances, and then where did you start in your home? Yeah, sure. Well, one of the things that motivated me just walked in this room, <laughs> where you're all this home set, you brought me this beautiful picture. Oh. Um, uh, the joys of working from home. Um, uh, but uh, let's see, a as I mentioned before, climate change is a huge motivator. Well, maybe I didn't mention that it was a huge motivator for me, but um, it is. Um, but also, as you saw, I have young kids. I have two. One is two and one is four. Um, and I want to ensure that I'm leaving them with a livable planet, right? I live in New England. Um, we are in the process of electrifying our home, but we still have a number of fossil fuel appliances, including um, home heating oil. We have got a big oil tank in our basement. Um, on one of the first cold days this winter, I was pulling out of the driveway to take my kids to daycare. Um, and my four-year-old from, from her car seat asked me, why is there smoke coming out of the chimney? And I knew I hadn't left a fire in the fireplace in the morning. Um, so at first I was about to say, Harper, there's no smoke coming out of our chimney. But I looked up and, and there was um, our furnace exhaust vents out through the chimney. And it was just that really visual reminder of what's at stake and why I'm doing this and why it matters to me. Um, but like I said, we still have a number of fossil fuel appliances. We bought our home um, last summer out in Western Massachusetts and it was basically all fossil fuel powered. Um, the first thing we did was take out the old stove and replace it with a, a, new, a nice new electric stove. Um, there was an inducted vent above the stove when we bought the house and knowing that children are particularly vulnerable to the health impacts from indoor air pollution associated with cooking with gas, it was important to us that really, you know, with two young kids, the, the first thing we did was, was make sure we've got that stove that um, reduces the pollutants that we're putting into our home. Yeah, absolutely. I think that having that visual reminder is always uh, very I, um, I myself am a renter like Joel and um, every time I turn on my gas stove, I can see that flame. It's just a reminder that we're burning fossil fuels every time we you know, cook up a meal. Um, Julia, you also started with your stove, didn't you? I did. Uh, so I had a different set of motivations. I'll also add a new one that I think is quite timely right now is as we look at the world responding to the Russian invasion of Ukraine and sanctions all over the world being imposed, one of the ways we can act is by getting off of our own uh, reliance on oil and gas. That is our one way to sort of impose sanctions, if you will, and ultimately just take more control of our energy here at home, especially if you electrify and couple it with an EV, perhaps distributed solar. So that way we have these uh, awesome locally generated generated resources powering us. So I think that adds some urgency to this moment in, in addition to the environmental ones. Uh, but I also had a personal motivator of not wanting to burn myself on my new kitchen renovation where the uh, stove has to go in the island. It's a small kitchen. We were redoing it and we're like, we only had so many options for where to put the stove. And so in my view, when it's in an island, the sleek look of an induction stove was just more practical. It's again, induction. So it doesn't have an open flame in the way that a gas stove would. So if you have kids or maybe just, you know, someone over for happy hour, it's kind of nice to know that you have technology that is not going to immediately be a hazard. And so I think we're getting to an exciting moment where these products are not only better for the environment, contributing to energy security, but actually just better products that might fit into our lives in more realistic and, and meaningful ways. And it evolved from there into getting, you know, an EV plug. We have a heat pump in our, our reformed garage. Um, and uh, we can get into it more later, but there are some challenges to doing a whole home that um, I think I discovered along the way too. But nonetheless, great motivators to get the project started. Yeah, that's exciting. And it sounds like a beautiful kitchen, I must say. Um, Johanna, I would love to hear from you about where you started when you started to make the transition to all electric appliances. Sure, I'd love to. So um, like Matt, I live in New England. Um, we, about 11 years ago, bought a farmhouse that was built in the 1860s. So it's an old building. It has like a field stone basement. And so we knew that air leaks were likely going to be rife in this structure. And so the very first thing we did was have an energy audit because just by shrinking the amount of energy we use overall in our building makes it that much easier to then you know, electrify all of our uses. So the first thing we did was um, 
just efficiency. And sure enough, there was, you know, like they ended up blowing ton of insulation into the attic and doing some pretty aggressive air sealing in the basement. Um, and then we realized that the previous owner, right before they sold the house, put in a brand new oil furnace. And we were like, no, now we have to keep that as a, you know, heat. So, cause it just, it didn't make financial sense to replace it on the spot, but they hadn't replaced the water heater. And it was this, you know, enormous 25 year old jalopy of a water heater. And we realized that our utility companies actually offered rebates for heat pump, hot water heaters. So, you know, I remember watching two really big, strong guys struggle to lift that enormous monster out of our basement. And then we replaced it with this just, you know, much sleeker, much more efficient model. And, um, yeah, one of the things we love about it is that it doubles as a, a dehumidifier in the basement. Um, you know, I used to have to go down there and manually empty the drawer from our dehumidifier to keep things from getting moldy. And now the heat pump hot water heater just takes care of that. Um, and it's just more efficient. So that was the first thing we did was the heat pump hot water heater. We love it. Um, and then in 2017, um, we actually bought a solar array for our yard. So it's a ground mounted array. We had to kind of dig a trench because our roof wasn't uh, sunny enough, but this corner of our yard was. So we we have that ground mount array. And so now, um, you know, are interested in making sure that more and more of the energy that we use in our house comes from that solar array. So we haven't yet got an EV, but I think our next car will probably be an electric vehicle. So we'll be able to plug that in. And then we just put a heat source in our kitchen, which had previously just always been freezing cold. And it's a mini split heat pump and it rocks. So that's how, that's how we got started. There's definitely more to do, but you know, we're on the path. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, Christopher, I think that you have a, had kind of a similar experience to Johanna. So I'd love to hear from you about where you started on this journey. Yeah, certainly. So we actually, um, cars may not be electrifying your house, but you know, they do have a lot of relevance for charging them. So we uh, actually switched both of our cars to electric back in 2014. Um, and at the time, um, the state of Georgia had like the top tax, state tax credit for EVs. It was $5,000 per car. Um, so we swapped both of our cars, um, immediately saved, you know, hundreds of dollars a month in gas, but also all of those tax credits became about 60% of the down payment for the house that we bought six months later. Um, unfortunately, sort of like Johanna, all of our mechanical systems were about five to seven years old in the house and we had just made you know, a huge purchase. Um, so replacing those fossil fuel appliances was not an immediate plan. But starting in 2020, we've actually been on a very aggressive schedule of replacing those. Um, the first one for us was the water heater. It hit 10 years old in 2020, so bye-bye. Um, and like Johanna, um, even here in the South, we have utility rebates and, you know, I, I love to help people understand, you know, the value, right, of, of how you can make these things affordable. So when we bought our heat pump water heater, we got it down to $300 because we had a state, uh, there was an IRS tax, tax credit at the time. Uh, we had a Georgia power rebate, plus Home Depot had a sale and I had a 15% off coupon. So at the end, it came down to $300 and it was cheaper than replacing it with just another gas one. So it's like uh, Joel had mentioned, having a plan is so, so important um, so that you can plan these things out and not just respond to an emergency when something dies. And since then, we've done our cooking um, over to induction and we just have our furnace, a natural gas switch over to heat pumps, which is our plan for next year, followed by solar. So um, we're quite far along the way. And like um, Julia, you know, we've learned some things. <laughs> Yeah, that's really exciting. I can't wait until it's an all electric home and we can maybe do a tour. Um, all right, so uh, let's talk a little bit about our families now because I think most of us um, on this panel don't live alone and changing over to electric appliances can be quite a topic of conversation. So um, Joel, let's start with you. What was it like talking with your family about this? Yeah, my family, my immediate, uh, my, my partner and my seven-year-old daughter, they're on board with it. Um, more interesting is my dad, uh, who worked in a, as an HVAC engineer for most of his career, and uh, he's pushed back on the idea that we need to go quickly. Um, and I have, you know, put it in terms of the planet he's leaving for his uh, for his grandkid, and uh, that's that resonates a little bit more with my mom. But um, 
but it has it has started to work. And uh, I also call him out when he forwards me like essentially fossil fuel disinformation about, uh, well, maybe going green is, is also bad for the planet. It's like, no, stop. You are fighting the future. Please, you know, give it up and get out of the way. So I'm, I'm, but I'm a little more aggressive maybe than other people about that. It's good that you're having the conversation at least. We'll have to make sure to send your dad over some great resources about a home electrification so we can convince him. Um, Johanna, what about you? What was it like talking with your family about this? Well, it's interesting. So I'll start by um, sharing some of the conversations I had with my kids and my husband. So when, and mostly this came up around the water heater and the solar. So, um, you know, for the kids, they were like, yeah, solar, woohoo. And my husband was like, Johanna, I appreciate that you want to protect the environment. I care about that too, but honestly, like, let's look at the cost. And so, um, you know, we had, I think three different solar installers come to our house. All of them got grilled by me and my husband at our picnic table. We had kind of like a good cop, bad cop thing going. Um, and you know, ultimately I think I got my husband to a place where he saw that with the federal tax incentives for solar, some of the state tax incentives and the SREC program, which, you know, essentially is a marketplace for solar credits. Um, we were going to be able to pay off our panels in, you know, seven to nine years. And that was a kind of long enough horizon for us recouping our investment that he felt comfortable doing it. And so, um, and then I will say, like, I feel like that was the heaviest lift I've had so far um, that kind of like got him in the mindset of like, oh, right, I can protect the planet and have it be good for our family's finances. And so doing things like installing the heat pump have then been easier and easier because we've kind of created the model for that kind of decision making. Um, and then, yeah, it's a little bit trickier with my extended family. So my brother is totally on board. He lives out in California and is like, you know, very much in the all electric mindset. But my stepdad who lives down in Virginia, you know, he used to work in professional kitchens. And when I mentioned to him like, hey, you guys should think about replacing your gas stove, you know, he was kind of like, well, can't do that. You know, like, I love the responsiveness. And I was like, well, have you tried an induction stove? They're pretty responsive. And there was definitely still, I think, work to do there um, to get, I don't know, to create a space where he was willing to entertain um, electrifying all aspects of his life. Yeah, absolutely. We just need to get everybody using an induction stove. Once they use it, they'll want to switch over. So you know, I think there's some truth to that. <laughs> yeah, that's the key, really. Um, all right, I have I, one last. Can I just add something? Yeah, the, please. The, you can buy a, a portable a single burner induction stove for fifty or a hundred bucks. So you could you can get that and try it out either for yourself or with uh, skeptics in your family or in your friend circle. Joel, have you tried that on your dad? uh he came and saw it the, 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 that's not the obstacle that's not the, it's, more of a, it's the mindset it's the mindset okay we'll keep working on him um all right i have one last question about um everyone's personal experience starting to make the switch um but what surprised you most about starting to use electric appliances um and let's start with you christopher yeah, great question, um, Brent. And, and honestly, it's all the misinformation that's out there from the affordability, the upfront cost, to even the performance. And, and like I said, we started with electric vehicles and it was purely based at that point um, on savings, which were huge and they continue to be huge eight years later. Um, but every technology that we've had since then I mean, the, like, as Julia mentioned, the performance is superior. I mean, the safe, there's better safety features. Um, you know, the water heater, we have, our kids are now out of the home, they're 20 and 21, but, you know, we had a gas water heater previously and we looked at going tankless to have water that lasted, but guess what? The heat pump water heater actually keeps up better only in heat pump mode than a simple gas one did. So um, getting, sharing those experiences of the financial savings, you know, how we were able to act, what we actually paid to get something done, and then what it's like living with it are, are really what I focus on because that's just where the misinformation is. Yeah, definitely. And we're excited that we can, you know, share that now here with, with other folks as well so that they, they know going into this um, process too. Johanna, what surprised you most about making the switch? Um, 
I will say I was surprised the first time I saw that we had a negative electric bill when we went solar. Like there, that was just a moment where I was like, this is so cool. Um, and so now in the summer months, you know, we get a credit on our bill and then September through April, I think we kind of, you know, use up that credit a little bit when there's less sunshine, but um, that was cool. The other things that have surprised me are um, we love the programmable nature of our hot water heater. So, you know, you put it on vacation setting and then you tell it, you know, oh, 10 hours before you get back, start heating water again. So if you want to, you know, do dishes or whatever, right when you get home, it's like ready and waiting for you, but not wasting energy while you're gone. I love that. Um, and then we also bought an induction stove a couple of years ago when our um, previous electric stove kicked the bucket. And just how fast you can boil a pot of spaghetti is truly staggering. Like when I went home to my mom's house and it took 20 minutes to heat up, a, you know, noodle water uh, on her gas stove, I was like, how do you live? You know, it was truly a, a, just a totally different way of interacting um, with the process of cooking dinner. That is true, Johanna, that you can, you can just boil water so quickly. And it's so it's fast. Like, it's so fast. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then I don't know, like the fact that basically a couple of minutes after cooking, you can put your palm on the cook surface and it, you don't like have the risk of burning yourself or, you know, I love cooking with my kids. They're seven or they're nine and 12 now. And I, I'm just less scared about them getting burned on the induction or happy stove. hours or happy <laughs> hours, right? Drunk, drunk friends over on your Island. <laughs> exactly. exactly. No one wants to get burned on a stove. Um, so whether it's friends, kids, family, whoever, um, it's a great benefit of induction. Um, awesome. Matt, what surprised you most about switching over to electric appliances? Um, well, this is a, actually not about not yet having switched. Mm. I was surprised to hear Johannes kitchen is warm right now. My house is freezing. I had to throw the sweater on right before we started. Um, oil prices are ridiculous. It is, um, we turned our heat off and, and we turn it back on today because it's snowing, but it's very low. We're trying to conserve heat and it's just, you know, it's very cold in our house. Um, and it would be nice to not have to think about that um, during, you know, times like these where, understandably prices are, are rising. Um, but then my, my other one was similar to Johanna when we got our electric stove, I, I saw that the quick boil feature like on the thing and I was like, what is this? And I have to say um, my kids are younger so it's less about cooking with them right now. And it's more about when a two-year-old and a four-year-old are waiting for uh, their mac and cheese. It is really nice to be able to quickly boil that water and, and get it to them. <laughs> That's so funny. My roommate loves mac and cheese. I'm sure that she would appreciate the uh, induction stove that could work quickly like that. Um, Julia, I'd love to hear from you about what surprised you most about switching over to electric appliances. Yeah, well, I think that what surprised me most was something that was brought up earlier about the ones I did not switch over. You know almost 90% of people um, purchase uh, an HVAC system in particular in an emergency situation. It's already broken, you need that heat immediately. And so we have a, a big challenge ahead of us in totally reversing the current sales cycles of this market and getting them to think more proactively and getting customers to think more proactively, which is hopefully why everyone's on this call is to start that journey as we've been calling it earlier. Because similarly to Johanna, my HVAC system in this new house had just been installed right before the sale. And there's no point at that in that moment of just junking it. It's kind of like if you have a used EV, the more environmental thing is actually to run the life of it for a time, because that is also energy and materials and everything before you just junk it. So we have to get earlier on in the sales cycle to capture people so we don't lock in these fossil fuel products for 10, 15 years. So I was surprised by that. Um, also the detail of the modeling they do. And I'd love to direct everyone, I'll drop a link in a moment to Nate the House Whisperer. If you haven't heard of him, he created the HVAC 2.0 program to start to educate contractors on how to talk to customers about going electric. And he doesn't even talk about going electric. So he did my home assessment. He came out and happened, I'm in California. He happened to be on a road trip and he did a blower door test and he did all these um, heating tests to just detect where the leaks were coming from. And that's a really important first step because that'll make sure you're not just sizing a large system to meet every need you currently have. It's starting with efficiency as has been discussed and then sizing your system correctly 
And crucially, the reason he calls it a home comfort assessment is making sure that your home is actually just working better for you at the end of the day. You don't have those drafts. You can eliminate air pollution. He can do all kinds of tests and not just Nate the House Whisperer, but this contractor network he's working with. So um, those are a couple of things that surprised me, the things that I did not electrify right away, but also where we're going in this discussion of the detail they can offer you and how it's just a general home upgrade and a comfort thing more than um, simply an environmental move. And I'll drop the link in the chat to Nate because he also has some great um, home, um, he has a great way to look at assessing your home and understanding the steps you could take to electrify. Great, thanks for sharing that, Julia. Um, and we'll definitely get into to more of that when we turn to our next topic, which is talking to the professionals. Um, but first, Joel, I want to invite you to also share, you know, what was it, what was surprising to you about switching over to electric appliances? Um, yeah, so the, like people said that the fact that they're all better uh, than the fossil fuel equivalents for the most part, um, that, you know, it's not a 2001 Prius, it's a 2022 Porsche. Um, but two things that surprised me, I have not done these things yet, but one is that uh, solar panels don't work in a grid outage. And so you do need, because in order to not electrocute the people working on the grid, but if you have a backup battery, uh, you can power your home from the battery. And hopefully in the next couple of years, you'll be able to potentially use your EV as your home backup battery. That's sort of being pioneered by Ford and Sunrun with the uh, Ford F-150 Lightning. And the other thing that surprised me um, was well, what did I, that, uh, oh, I forgot what I was going to say. Uh, where'd it go? If it comes to you. Yeah. It they're just better. Oh, the, the, the EVs come with a plug and that you don't need a fast charger, that it comes with a cable. You can plug it into a regular wall outlet and that'll charge like 40 out, 40 miles overnight. And so I, you know, they make a big deal about, oh, where are you going to charge it? Where are you going to charge it? Get the car, plug it in, see if that works for you. So those are the two things that surprised me doing the research. Um, it is surprising to think of a car like a phone that you could just plug it into the wall. Um, all right, so I wanna to turn to our next topic now, which is um, about talking to the experts. So if you start to electrify your home, you most certainly won't be going it alone. Um, professionals like contractors and realtors um, will play a really critical role in this transition. So I wanna talk about how to discuss going all electric with the professionals that you'll work with during this process. So my first question is, if you're thinking about going electric, what questions should you ask your contractor? And Joel, I'll turn it back to you here. Yeah, so again, in the guide, uh, electrify everything in your home, free download, rewiringamerica.org. Um, there are lots of questions to ask contractors about each of the individual things that you might want to electrify. And one way to think about the guide uh, is how, how can this guide help me make a plan? And then how can the guide help me be a good customer to the contractor? ask the right questions about what needs to happen, how they're gonna do the thing they're gonna do, whether there are things that they haven't considered. But I did hear good advice on talking to HVAC contractors in particular around heat pumps, because a lot of contractors still don't really, they're not on board with heat pumps. They think they don't work in cold climates, which is not true. They think that they don't work very well, which is not true. It's sort of outdated ideas about, uh, about heat pumps, just like, you know, it's not a 2022 Porsche, even though that's what we have now. And so you can ask them questions. One, do you install heat pumps? Two, are you going to do a what's called a manual J, which is a calculation for sizing the heat pump properly? Uh, three is, are, are, you know, will it include room by room airflow or something like that? Um, and these these questions will help weed out contractors who are not going to do a good job. And if they don't answer a, a good answer to any of these, move on, find another contractor, and you can do all this over the phone before they even come out to your house. Great, that's very helpful to hear. Um, and we actually are very lucky to be joined by a sustainable realtor, Christopher. So Christopher, I'd love to hear from you about what questions you should ask your contractor and your realtor when you're working on this. Yeah, well, Joel had summed it up great, and I would definitely say check out his book. Um, it really does come down to, you know, old ideas, and that's both with your contractors and realtors. It's one of the things that, that me and colleagues like me, um, we work within our industry to make sure that more realtors are informed so that when buyers and sellers of properties or people who want to have these properties come to us, we understand what they're, they're, they're looking for. Um, 
since Joel answered great questions to ask, I want to help you. How do you narrow it down and not have to call 100 HVAC companies? Because even in a big city like Atlanta, we only have two or three that are really prepared to work with some of these technologies. Um, so for me, what's worked, one, I, I am privileged in the fact that I'm so deep in the green space that I, I have the connections. But you can also look at nonprofits in your area. So, for example, here in Atlanta, we have an organization called South Base. Um, you know, look for similar or USGBC, perhaps look for similar organizations in your area. Reach out to them because they're usually training and certifying vendors um, and ask them either for a list. They may direct you to their website, which also may be great to check Google and get on their website. But then also you can contact them by phone or email and see who they recommend. They will have a list of folks in your area. And I think that would be the best place to start. It's gonna save you a lot of time. Um, and then ask the questions that Joel had. You know, and same thing with realtors. Um, we are still a very small minority. Um, we have 1.5 million realtors in the country. We have about another 1.5 million people who are just a real estate agent. So about 3 million people selling homes to you potentially. Um, only 1% of realtors have the green designation, which is a class um, given by the National Association of Realtors. And we do maintain a site, it's green.realtor. Um, and it has a database of all of our members who are green designees. So that is a great place to start. And yes, we have them in every state, even my home state of Georgia, we have about 100. So um, we have somebody for you. Um, that is a great place to go and find somebody local to you. You're also welcome to reach out to me. Um, and I can, I probably have somebody that I know in every major market across the US and I can make an introduction. Um, but you know, it, it's about having a conversation with people and, and making sure that they understand this um, and that they kind of align that they're going to represent you and do it right. I have one more thing to add. That was, that was a good point, Christopher, about narrowing it down. Nate Adams, who Julia mentioned earlier, and by the way, not just Nate Adams does energy audits. Lots and lots of people will do an energy audit for you, but it's cool that, that he did it for her. But he recommends you can, if you identify a heat pump that you're interested in, like a Mitsubishi or something like that, you can call the manufacturer and ask who the good installers are who sell the most like inverter driven heat pumps in your area. And you can kind of work backwards from uh, the manufacturer to the contractor. Great. It's very helpful. Um, and it sounds like Christopher would be a very good contact for anybody who's looking for a green realtor. Um, so I encourage you to reach out to him. Um, Julia, I want to invite you also to share um, what questions you would recommend folks ask their realtor when they're thinking about going electric. Yeah, well, I think one thing you can ask is if you're shopping for a house, ask about what the energy usage is in the home. That's not always shown. I think, you know, our company, Good Leap and others are trying to get Zillow and MLS and other platforms to show energy um, usage in a home. And that is something that certain cities have already have programs around. So just more transparency there, because that might factor into your number crunching on what products make sense for you to invest in if you're looking for a home. Um, I think another trend that's happening on that front is not necessarily a question to ask, but um, we're working at the appraiser community as well. So how before the buyer gets involved, how can we start to factor in uh, the fact that someone has maybe already made investments in clean energy products and electric products in a home? How do we value that correctly? We've done it already in solar. Good Leap started financing solar. Uh, several years ago, and we started, we work with the appraisal community a lot because we are actually also a mortgage company and we can enable you to refinance and roll your solar into your home loan or your electric HVAC or whatever product you finance with us. Um, but now we're starting to get to the tip of the edge with the appraisers to value those electric products as well. It takes a lot of conversations, getting them comfortable that this technology works, people will pay for it. Um, we're at the dawn of a new era there, but hopefully it starts to be reflected in home values appropriately. Um, I guess the last thing I'll say is I started electrifying as part of a renovation, right? So I think one area for more work is just getting our general contractors to understand this as well. If you're a homeowner, you may be doing a bunch of things at one time. So I think a way we could expand this really quickly would be to find those key people like a GC who's then going to commission out to a bunch of other contractors for your project and have them know what products are best for you. Because that is a tough thing. I had to push our contractor to help us find the induction stove and they knew we wanted it and still forgot to put in the 240 volt in the right place because they just weren't familiar with the technology. So I think those um, individuals might be a great place to start educating. And my last point on this is Good Leap started a training program called Next IQ. It's like a masterclass style video program where we have all this training for contractors 
so they can start to learn more about the latest products. What is the new inverter that came out? What's the new Mitsubishi um, HVAC system? Because there's just a lot of, um, yeah, education that needs to happen for those out in the field talking to customers so they know what types of things will work for you and to sell so they don't unintentionally um, dissuade you from going that route. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think you're right. Workforce development is going to be really crucial in making sure that we're able to make this transition. And it sounds like Next IQ um, would be a really great resource for folks to, to start looking into and, and using. So thanks for sharing that. Um, all right. Next, I want to talk a little bit about challenges. Um, so I'm hoping that we can chat about what challenges homeowners face when trying to go electric and also how we can solve them. So Johanna, I'm going to start with you for this. Excellent. Um, all right. I see two big challenges and no doubt the biggest challenge to widespread electrification in our homes is just the upfront cost differential. Um, you know, I think there are some people, a minority of people who are willing to make an investment in electric technology just because it aligns with our values. But most of us don't have that luxury. It has to also make financial sense. And you know, I think a lot of these things make financial sense in the long term, but you know, they're real immediate budgetary decisions that, so we actually have to have it make sense in the short term too. And so, you know, when I think back to buying our heat pump, hot water heater, that $750 rebate from mass save that was, you know, right at the point of sale made it a no brainer for us. And you know, the more that rebates for these technologies can be upfront, direct pay at the point of purchase, rather than through some cumbersome and opaque process, um, the better it's going to be. Um, so that's the first challenge is just, you know, we got to levelize that upfront cost. And then the second challenge is a bunch of people will have to potentially buy new cookware for their induction stove. Um, but as somebody who loves cast iron, I can say cast iron works great on no matter what kind of stove and you can pass it on to your children and your great, 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 great grandchildren and it'll never go bad. So I hope that's a change people are willing to make, but it is a challenge because people love their pots and pans. That's good for waste too, reducing waste. So I like that solution. Um, Matt, can you talk a little bit about, um, the challenges that homeowners face and how we can solve them? Yeah, I, I think Johanna hit on some of the logistical and cost challenges and some of the other ones have been brought up um, in the conversation and in the chat. Um, and a lot of these can be mitigated through pro electrification policies, incentives, um, education for uh, contractors, all of that. Um, but I do wanna talk about one broader challenge and that's the public education and the public knowledge on, on the issue, right? The whole process can feel complicated and daunting. The average person isn't steeped in the data about health and climate, as many of us are. Um, many people have had a gas stove or gas appliance, other gas appliances for their entire lives and have never thought about any of the you know, emissions issues. Um, people have had their furnaces or water heaters in the basement out of sight. They only think about them when something goes wrong. Um, and then, of course, there's an extremely well-funded gas industry-led effort to downplay the problems associated with using fossil fuels in our homes and buildings and pushing back hard against electrification. Um, you know, take a look at cookingwithgas.org. You'll see cooking with gas is the greatest thing in the world. Um, and there's no bad parts about it. Um, so a lar and, a, and, a, and a large part of the public has bought into the gas industry's arguments that cooking with gas is superior or um, the, the emissions are, are uh, concerns are overblown. Um, uh, you take the, and then, you know, one another piece of it, right? Take the term natural gas, for example. Um, it doesn't mean anything natural gas. It just sounds good because it's natural. It can't be bad. Um, and, and, you know, we have to change that, right? We have to change the way we say that term. It sounds trivial, but it works. Um, there's polling that 77% of people uh, had a favorable, favorable view of natural gas, which was fa far higher than the favorable ratings for their views on methane, for example. And less than a third were able to link nat that natural gas is primarily made up of methane. 
So that's why I, I don't call it natural gas. I call it methane gas because that's what it's, it is. It's primarily made up of methane gas and that lets people connect the, uh, the, the actual issue with what the gas is, but calling it natural gas just lets people, it's natural, it's clean. Mm-hmm. Um, and so all of this suggests that to get to the place where we can facilitate this strategic nationwide shift to electric buildings, we have to do more to educate and win the public, push back against the industry arguments, the industry tactics, somebody brought up in the chat, um, these preemption bills that the industry has been pushing uh, uh, in a lot of places in country that make it harder for local governments to, to um, pursue electrification policies. We need to push back against all of that, get the public on board, and that gets us to the place where we can start to overcome of the, all of these logistical and cost challenges uh, that people are facing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, If you live in Michigan or Pennsylvania, there is a preemption bill in your state and you should call your state representatives and tell them that you don't want them to support it. Um, Thanks for sharing that, Matt. Um, Julia, I'd love to hear from you about what challenges homeowners can face in this process and how we can solve them. Yeah, I think a lot of things have been uh, brought up. I'm going to go to add two other points. It's not just for homeowners, but other challenges we have are manufacturers making more products. It's something that came up in the chat. We even need products that meet different kinds of requirements. If you go to Nate Adams' website, Nate the House Whisperer, he has a whole blog on like very specific asks he has for carrier on types of products he needs that just work better for customers, work better for installers. We need to get the U.S. industry more engaged on this. Companies like Mitsubishi have already been there, um, but just you know, giving the right market signals with bills like Senator Heinrich's legislation, I think will will juice the market and then getting American companies to step up will be really powerful and meaningful there and hopefully be great for business. Um, The other challenge I see is the equity side and making sure that we actually have these technologies reach more people. They do have higher upfront costs. So again, rebates are important. We need policy to step in here to grow the market as we do with all kinds of things in earlier stages of those product cycles. Um, because uh, obviously we want this to work for everybody. And simultaneously, there's a very bigger, much more complex issue about keeping electricity rates affordable and low around the country. Um, That's a bigger discussion around how we plan our transmission lines and where we get power from and legacy systems and new systems and utilities are at the heart of it. All of us are there too with the bills that we pay, but we want to make sure that as people electrify, it's affordable to do so. So there's a bigger conversation. I just want to plant in everyone's mind around how we keep electricity costs low uh, as we make the switch. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Christopher, I see you come off mute. You know that I'm going to call on you next. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on this as well. Yes, certainly. Well, I mean, all the great answers are gone and I don't want to take um, Joel's because I I don't really want to touch too much on electrical panels because he's the expert on that. Um, But, you know, I'll talk a little bit about my industry and the role that we can play. Um, You know, I, some people think I joke when I say this, but, you know, real estate agents are the original influencer. And if you've had a really great real estate agent, you know that, you know, they are the ones that even after the sale you go to and you ask for referrals to vendors or you they, you ask about, um, you know, a renovation and what would it do to, um, you know, your potential resale value and things like that. You know, they are ambassadors of your community. And um, we still have a lot of folks in our industry that have not experienced these things, you know, but it's like with the EVs, butts and seats, right? That's how you get the knowledge, um, you know, so we've done stuff locally in getting, you know, uh, induction cooking demonstrations for our, our top producing and busy realtors and realtor leaders. We are trying to inform um, our members so that they are the source of source of information when buyers and sellers come to them with these questions. And when you're working with contractors, the, the challenge has kind of come up here before is the lack of a team. We have to support those who support you and those who are advancing what you're trying to do, whether it's your contractor, uh, you know, somebody that works in green building, a realtor, you need to build that team around people that are all doing the same thing um, and help each other prove the business model. Um, that's how we're going to have large scale success here. Yeah, absolutely. We will definitely have to build our team and and prove that business model. All right, Joel, let's turn to you and hear about some panels. <laughs> Thanks, Christopher, you didn't, for not stealing the thunder. But the thing, the thing that I found to be probably the biggest obstacle is uh, is getting caught defaulting into getting another fossil fuel appliance instead of an electric appliance when it dies because you didn't have a plan for how you were going to replace it. And so 
either it's because you uh you know when your hot water heater dies you just want hot water again you don't care if it's electric or not but uh if you go and call the contractor and nobody has a heat pump water heater or they do have one and you know your electrical panel is too small and so you can't get one you're going to lock in another 10 15 years of fossil fuel burning in your home so the idea behind again free guide rewiringamerica.org um is learn what you need to get done make some calls initially to figure out what you uh, what you have to do and make a plan so that you don't get painted into a corner on your electrical panel, you don't get painted into a corner on your furnace, on your water heater. Uh, you know how you're gonna get it done when the time comes or sooner if you want and, uh, and you make the upgrades that you need to, whether it's installing wiring ahead of time or getting a panel or a service upgrade. And uh, again, read the guide, uh, it's free and hopefully it'll help you make a plan. Hopefully it will. All right, we only have a couple minutes left here and I wanna be respectful of everybody's time, but I also want everyone on this call to leave with one action that they could take today to start the transition to clean energy homes. So let's just do a rapid fire, 15 seconds. Um, I'll go around and call on folks and we can share one thing that everyone on this call can do today. And let's start with Christopher. Awesome, well, I would say just start. I mean, that, that's the biggest thing. So many of us, it is important to have a plan, but some, don't don't wait too late to, to do that plan. Find what is your oldest appliance, um, what is the low hanging fruit and start today. All right, number one, start today. Find your oldest appliance, Joel. Download the guide. Uh, you can knock off the number one thing in the guide that the first chapter is about switching your plan, your electricity plan to a, an all renewable plan if it's available. You might be able to do that in 10 minutes and then you've only got nine left and, and you know, just make as much progress as quickly as possible doing the first thing on the list. There's a little do now section in the guide on how to move forward on all the things so that it's not overwhelming and again, make a plan. Great. All right. Two, we've got download the guide and switch your electricity plan. Julia. I reiterate those things. Um, I think I'd also say I'd reiterate what Senator Heinrich said, which is call your lawmakers, let them know you want them to pass the Build Back Better Act. There is a tax credit in there, first time ever one for 30% off for an electric HVAC system or geothermal heating system or a electric hot water heat pump. So if that passes, that will be a watershed moment for this whole sector. So that's something everybody can do on top of those purchasing decisions we, we talked about. And um, hopefully you check out the guides have been discussed in the chat and the links there. There. And the last thing I'll say is look to other products like solar and EV that'll help us reduce um, the, the fossil fuel usage that we still have on the larger grid while the larger grid also continues to transition. So there's a whole comprehensive set of solutions to look at at one time that, you know, I see people talking about in the chat, I think will help meet our environmental needs. Great. Thanks, Julia. All right. Call your lawmakers is number three. Matt, what can we do? Uh, Joel mentioned earlier that there are these great plug-in countertop induction cooktops, one burner, 50 to $100. If you have a gas stove, get one of those, try out the induction technology, reduce the amount you use your gas stove, enjoy how fast it boils water and how great it is. Um, and if you do have a gas stove, make sure that your vent is properly working, ducted and turned on when you use it. Great, thank you, Matt. All right, last but not least, Johanna, what is one thing we can all do today? One thing we can all do today, we all have a U.S. Senator. So um, Senator Heinrich spoke articulately about the Zero Emission Homes Act. Aaron is going to drop a link in the chat. Everyone can take action there to contact your senator and ask them to support those provisions. That sets up the incentives that Julia was talking about and builds support for making sure that the electrification provisions and the you know pass in whatever budget reconciliation mechanism we're able to muster. So that's it. Please take action there. That's the fifth one. Great. Thank you all. All right. I know we are, are at time. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Most especially thank you to our wonderful panelists, Johanna, Matt, Julia, Christopher, and Joel. We really appreciate all that you are doing to support the transition to clean all electric homes. Um, and even though our panel is over, let's not stop the conversation here. I'd like to invite everyone to also join us on Twitter today using the hashtag, hashtag Clean Energy Homes Day to tell your friends and family about the benefits of going all electric and maybe even to share any pictures of your own electric appliances that you might have.
Um, with that, thank you all for joining us and have a very happy clean energy homestay. Bye everyone.